historical transitional book called the Acts of the Apostles. Other people think it maybe should better be named which is not an inspired title, by the way. Some people think it should be called Acts of the Lord Jesus, because it was the continuing work of him. And the end of it. Um, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, since it, what we're reading about right now is the dynamic, historic, history-making event where the Spirit of God came, and uh, what a difference we're discovering. We're going to see that in particular in today's text as we look at the effects, the results of the Spirit of God coming and how it uh, started the church and what that church was like. <clears throat> I'd like to read this text to you, and uh, even though we have the convenience of being able to put things up on the screen. Um, I believe that the better way of learning and remembering is for you to keep your Bible open and to follow along. And one of the things that I do in preparation and coordinating with the video ministry is to try to anticipate all of the various passages and references that we're going to be uh, connecting with and as we work through this passage, the scripture together. But so we use our Bible, and uh, I want to tell you one of my real annoyances, one of my real pet peeves when I was growing up, if I was in a message and they read the Bible to get a starting verse, and then you were done. You never really used your Bible after that. It was all good Christian words but, and stories, but the Bible teaching was absent. I just, my wife bruised my side more than once as we would sit with those kind of things, and I would fidget. Um, but I want to read to you uh, today, our text is out of Luke, or out of, it's, it's Luke's the author, but out of Acts chapter 2, I was going to, um, I was going to deal with another phrase in the sermon, in Peter's sermon, but I've given that information over to Rashid, and uh, he will be, when he teaches in a couple weeks, he will bring out some of those things in that, in that Christian ed uh, setting that Sunday morning here in a couple weeks. But follow along. And what I started to say is uh, you will learn more if you don't just listen, but if you will connect with the verses. And especially on the back of your bulletin, again, we've got an outline with fill in the blanks. And hopefully I've anticipated and the slides will help you to see what is the things as we work through the passage, how to correctly fill in those blanks. What came before, when we start reading here in verse 42, what comes before is the uh, report of the results of Peter's sudden, unprepared for by his experience. He did not know that he was going to be preaching that sermon. He did not know that that was the day the Spirit of God was going to come and indwell him permanently and that this was going to have this particular dynamic effect. But um, in verse 41, let me just refer to that and then we'll begin our text today. It's from verse 42 through the end of this chapter. It says, So then, at the end of, at the end of that message, <clears throat> those who had received his word, that it would imply that there were some that did not either listen or except the, tr the truth of God's word through Peter. Those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And uh, in verse 42, we find out more of what was the way of these 3,000 plus the 120 that had come to gather in the upper room and were in prayer. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as everyone, as anyone might have need. 
day by day, continuing with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. When I read verse 42 to you, I need to make a statement that may be like a confession. I've preached on this text before. I've preached on it here and I've preached on it in, in Hawaii and in other places because this particular text has these statements of what that early church was doing. And, and many times when I have, have used this text and I've taught from it, I have uh, presented this as the model of what that we hold up as the standard, the reference in, in activities of what any biblical church should be doing. And I think that I want to correct that today. I'm not saying that those shouldn't be done, but I think that there's a more significant underlying truth that is being revealed here. And I believe that this is the beauty of God's work is that he gets away from just the externals. He drills down into the heart. And today I want to come across that way. It's my desire. The danger otherwise is that this becomes a to-do list of activities. Uh, I am a, to a list person. That is my makeup. I have an ongoing list. It is uh, in my phone. I, if things don't get on it, it may not happen. But I ha my wife tries to get, I give her access to it, but she hadn't caught on to that yet. She'll hear this message and I'll be in trouble. <laughs> but it's, the danger is that we just see this as a list of check marks, that if we do this, 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 everything's okay. Young people, hear me especially, but older people is just as important for us no matter how old we are. We need to not just be about the externals. It's got to be the heart. One of the turnoffs, and why I address the young people in particular, one of the turnoffs for younger people is that they see this. They see us not be about the heart. And they see it be sometimes empty or shallow. And I don't want to be that way. Um, sometimes if we feel that we're just doing these right things, that we're obedient, that we've met the requirements, right? Or even proud. Our church has got these activities. We do these things and so forth. And, you know, I, I see Jesus dealing with people like that, and he tried to get underneath that kind of thinking and to deal with heart. So let's try that today. The test of a New Testament church is not just doing the right things, is it? It's more a matter of having the right attitudes, of having the right motivations, having the right heart, maintaining the, the correct and right relationships. First and foremost is the relationship with our Savior, with Jesus. We'll, we'll see that, I think, many times in this, in this passage. It, just, it wasn't just what the church in Jerusalem did that Luke is trying to convey here. <clears throat> He's really trying to explain the how and the why they did these things. I would remind you that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus condemned this externalism that he was dealing with in the religious establishment of his day. The way they did their prayer and fasting was all about, you know, what people saw. It was all about the externals. And he says... Uh, and let, I'll just give you the references, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. I won't have us read that. It's a longer passage. It'll get us off track. But in that, in that passage, Jesus says, he does this comparison. You've heard this, but then he brings them back to more the heart and the essential matter. But I do want to read to you another thing that Jesus said, and that is out of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. In his Sermon on the Mount, listen to this. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, 
will enter. So it's not just our words. It's not just the right external phrases. It's not just the magic statements. God knows the heart. He, said, he goes on to say, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And he says, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. And notice that he calls it lawlessness. They were doing the right things, but if it wasn't for the right heart reasons, he calls it lawlessness. Let's not be guilty of that at Valley Bible Church. I think what Luke is trying to convey to us in this passage is that on this first day and the days that followed, for this brand new beginning of the church of Jesus Christ, this is the literal biblical church of Jesus Christ right here. It's in Jerusalem, but it's, it's soon spread. This church is not isolated to a location. I would trust that we're part of that church today. But this, these new believers were like newlyweds. They just, they just couldn't, you'll see this, they just couldn't seem to be apart from one another. They were so one anothered all of a sudden. They came, many, the majority of these people did not know each other. They came from various regions of the Roman Empire gathering on this annual feast of Pentecost and then the, something changed. And these strangers now became something unique. There was new, now a bond. They had this in common. You know what it was that they had in common? Jesus. And because of that, we see the evidences of their relationships with one another, all of whom in these folks were, of those that believed, that were saved, they were now part of one another. And so the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of breads, the prayers, they're all activities that they did together. But notice there's a change. Amongst the disciples, remember, throughout the, the Gospels, you always had these instances where the, the writers are real transparent about the way the disciples were. It was all about me first and competition and so forth. That's gone. The church is now caring and promoting the interests of Christ and of one another. That is the attitude that we would want to see. It's not just togetherness. It was unity. It was supernatural unity. It's not just human affection. Clubs can do that. You can have that in a sports team to get togetherness. This was genuine love. There was also another thing that we're going to see here, and that is that amongst all these sudden brand new baby Christians, there is a, there's a sense of, of awe, of reverence. They're, of, they're inspired by these evidences of the power of God. And there were things that were taking place then that are not standard in our day because the apostles are not here to be demonstrating their role in the church because their part was before the New Testament was completed, that, that was all the people had to know what the will and the word of Christ was. And how did you know if you should listen to them or some other guy that comes along saying that he speaks for Christ? Well, God said, I'm going to authenticate and, and demonstrate that these individuals alone are my messengers by signs and wonders that you're going to see them be able to do. And you're going to see that in those transitional days as we go on in our study in the book of Acts. But the, but the effect on these first days of the church being there on the people, it says it there in verse 43, is that everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And it goes on to say why and many signs, many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. So it was, that was what was going on. Now, <clears throat> we, uh, we want to look at these 
snapshot. This is kind of a biblical portrait, but remember what I said in the introduction. I am not trying to say that these are the externals that we need to manufacture. This is the result of what, because of their new wonderful, thrilling and awe-inspired relationship to Jesus Christ was like. If there's anything we would take away, I trust the Lord to give us today in this morning message. It would be that we would get back to our first love and that we would have the same sense of appreciation for the written word of God and that we would have, the, because of our love for Jesus Christ, we would have that spill over into our affections for one another in the Christ. So there are three marks or three characteristics that they exhibited. And this was a healthy church, even though it might have been an immature church. We're going to follow along a little while in our study in Acts, and we'll see some of the, the challenges that they came to have, but we won't see them this morning. But in filling out your outline, a healthy church is marked by continual devotion to the Lord. This is what the sermon was about. This is what Peter was trying to, to really accomplish. They asked other questions, but he bridged from their curiosity to expose to them who Jesus was, that he was Lord God. And they had really messed up because so many of this, the people there in Jerusalem during the previous days for Passover had taken and crucified him. They'd been part of this. And he now, he now has made it clear to them that the one that had walked among them, the one that they had heard about, the one that had done so many miraculous signs to authenticate that he was truly from God, that he was the one that, they sh that was their savior. They should be devoted to him. Now notice, please, in verse 42, the phrase... They were continually devoting themselves. The Greek construction of that, that translation, strongly teaches us that this was a constant resolve that was demonstrated. This, of all the things <coughs> that are following in the text, it is, it is a continual it is continual devotion. So this is the first point, and it's the big point, is that this healthy church, and I would submit to you that this is what we should be, if you want to personalize, if you want to bring something to your own heart and apply it to you individually, it's this. Are you, or I will make it personal for me, am I? continually devoting myself to the Lord Jesus? Or has it become, in these years of knowing him, has it just become my culture? Has it just become, you know, I get up on Sunday mornings, I do the same things, I come, I hear, we sing these songs, we do these things, da, 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 da. It's just performance, or is it continually devoting myself? That's the challenge. There. Now, we, let's measure that. And by the way, I just want to, before we look at these four things the text tells us that demonstrate their devotion to Him, their love, their relationship to Him, this Greek phrase translated in our Bibles, continually devoting, is um, there are ten uses of this verb in the Greek New Testament and one use of it as a noun in the Greek New Testament. And out of those, eight of the times, and I'm going to split those into six and two, that verb and noun are used to describe the connection or the activity of prayer. Continually devoting themselves in prayer, for instance, or to the ministry of the word. So these two are big in the rest of the, the New Testament. They're something we should never get away from. Nothing should ever take precedence over them. Nothing should ever crowd these out of our 
gathered experience or our private at home walk into the week experience. Let me ask you, for you to answer between you and the Lord, are you demonstrating the heart that is continually devoted to Jesus Christ in prayer and in his word? Well, there, in our text, there are four ways. The first way in which this devotion, continual devotion to the Lord is demonstrated is in the devotion to the teaching of his word. Now, there were 3,000 brand new converts all at once. Do you know how many people live in the city boundaries of Enoch? Anybody an idea? You're twice as much, it's, it's more like seven. Who knew that? Smart guy. You must Google or something, I don't know. <laughs> All right. There are about half of the people, so every other person living in this community of Enoch what would we do? Think about this. They didn't even have a facility like this. What would, what would happen if something brought them together and God touched Albert and he had the unction to just give this message that was scriptural and powerful and half a Enoch trusted Christ. We're alive in, unto God. And they had questions and they wanted to know and they were thrilled and they, couldn't, they didn't want to leave and they just, what would we do? Now, I've heard preachers talk about this and they, they were expecting this and they thought, you know, hey, this is the way it really ought to be. God's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You know, Jesus Christ, same. And the, if we're doing this right, this is the results. This is the formula for mass evangelism. Everybody should be there. You've heard probably messages like that. And I'm not going to go there with this at this point. I'm just saying that was their situation. On the first day of the church, 3,120, because there was 120 people in the upper room, added to about, it says, 3,000 brand new Christians from all over the empire that had come for that annual feast. And what would you do? Well, it's great, but it's also, wow, challenging. They had a massive job. These people... Although as Jews, they probably had been raised as the typical Jew with the synagogue background. They had been raised. The one thing the Jews did do very, very well is they taught history and the Torah. They knew the law. They knew the historical people, the, the big events from the background. And so they had that, that framework to work with. I'm not saying there weren't some proselytes that were... Gentiles or something, but by and large, you still, the, what they're missing, they know almost nothing about Jesus Christ. They ha most of these people did not hear the Sermon on the Mount. They did not hear any of this teaching from Christ. So I think maybe what happened in those immediate days, as long as some of these people could stick around, um, is that they, when, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, it talks about that beginning with Moses and with all the prophets that he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. I think that they just g gave a crash course in Old Testament Christology, you might say. And they just went through the prophecies and the characteristics, and the Isaiah passage, and I mean, you, they just, and the people were just, they couldn't get enough. I mean, this is just like, wow, you ever seen the appetite of a brand new baby? There's no stopping that baby. It's going to, I mean, it's been embarrassing times. I pick up one of my kids, and it's not going, I say, I'm not the one. Here, take it, mama. <laughs> they are hungry, and so it is with a brand new Christian. 
And sadly, folks, today, so many churches are not feeding their people. Brand new Christians, maybe that's why there's not more people being saved is because God does not like to take a brand new baby and put them into a place where they'll starve. The last three letters that Paul wrote put it this way. <clears throat> In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, I think I should have us turn there. They, the early church was healthy because it was marked by continual devotion to the Lord in the teaching of his word. And in 1 Timothy, Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 13, <clears throat> he says, and remember Paul's mindset as he's writing this epistle, and especially in the second letter that he wrote, to Timothy, the final one, he knows he's coming close to the end of his time to serve the church. And he is now downloading as much as he can, even through his epistles, to Timothy to say, Timothy, you're about to grab that baton from me and to take people, as I have sought to bring people to Christ, You've got to do that. You've got to serve his church, too. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, <clears throat> I'm going I'm to begin at verse 12, but verse 13 is what I want to see. He says to Timothy, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Verse 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture and to exhortation and what? Teaching. And teaching. Teaching what? Well, he's made it clear. Scripture, the Word. There is nobody's brilliant thoughts and inspirations that can come close to the teaching of the precious, holy, eternal Word of God. A few verses down, verse 16, he says to Timothy, uh, again, I'll pick it up at the, verse 15, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Please understand what Paul is saying is not saying you are forgiven from your sins by pursuing, teaching, presenting, and for other people to be listening. He's using salvation in the secondary sense of growth and maturity as a believer. And he's saying this is, this is, the, this is the key, foundational, essential central activity and pastors and teachers down throughout the church age. This is the critical thing. Let's go over to Titus. See another one that he wrote to Titus. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 9. He says to Titus, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Sound teaching. Devote yourself. But again, it's about devotion to the Lord. And this is simply the indicator. It's the, thermostat, the thermometer and the thermostat. It will reveal the warmth of your devotion by how you read and attend to the teaching, the doctrine, the teaching of Scripture. And it will also change your temperature. The more you do it, the more your relationship to Christ should be facilitated. Notice that I did not say just come to church. You can come to church, but if you do not get fed, if you do not 
exercise your mind and heart in the truths of, word, of the word of Christ, it was a social exper experience. It's not the same. So one more, and this is one that haunts me as a pastor. I'm sure it haunted others in our church that have had the experience of leading a church. The final words, the final chapter of the great apostle Paul recorded for us in scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 4. And he says in the first couple of verses, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. He goes on to talk about that that's not always going to be easy. There's going to be times when people are not going to appreciate it. They're not going to, they're not going to encourage you. They will not want to endure this teaching of sound doctrine. They'll want to find teachers that will tickle their ears. Tell them what they want to hear. But don't stop. You preach the word. So a healthy church must be devoted to Christ, and it's evidenced in one way here by our attention to the Word of God, to the teaching of the Word of God. Secondly, a healthy church is devoted to Christ, and it's indicated by our devotion to corporate worship. Now, under this point, there are certain aspects in the text of this corporate worship. And I, I'm a little bit torn here on some of these. Again, uh, in being fair to the text, I, I don't want to read into it. Uh, I want to kind of look at all that, that Luke has said. But there are the first aspect of what corporate worship here involved um, because I don't want you to picture, remember, there's no sanctuary, there's no auditorium, there's no platform, there's no pulpit for this church. They never had one. It's a church, and by the way, this building is not a church. You know, the church gathered here today in this place, but they didn't have a building. In fact, the text talks about that they met sometimes at the temple, sometimes they met in homes, but it didn't change the fact that they were a church. I'm not against having a building. I think it's a great opportunity and the building should be used for this purpose, but their situation in devoting to corporate worship, it did not handle their, it did not hinder, obstruct their corporate together worship experience. The first thing, the first aspect of it involves the breaking of bread. Notice how it says that. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread. Now, typically, and I've taught this in the past too, just looking at that, I said, oh, sounds like communion. That was the celebration of the Lord's table. And certainly there are many, many times in the Gospels and especially in Luke, we're looking especially at Luke's use of this term, um, where that is uh, what it means. Uh, the breaking of bread often refers to communion or the Lord's table. Matthew 26, 26 says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And so that definitely is one of the... Ways. But there are other references where it's not, it wasn't. The fra phrase breaking of bread was used, <coughs> but it wasn't uh, communion. One for sure comes from Luke. It's uh, way back at the end. Let me put something in my Bible to keep my place here. Luke chapter 27, the very end. 
<clears throat> and in this passage, Paul is with a bunch of other people on a ship, and they are in danger. There's a storm, and there's a plot. If I remember the situation, the staff, the sailors, the, the crew, is planning to abandon the ship. They're going to lower a lifeboat, and they're going to jump on it, and they're going to they're going to abandon these people to die in this storm. And Paul goes, and Paul is on this ship because he is being, um, he's being given a free passage to Rome at the expense of the Roman government to go have his appeal before Caesar. And he's got soldiers that are accompanying him. And so he tells the soldiers, he says, hey guys, you better keep an eye on the crew. They're getting ready to get in that boat. And if they make it off of here, we're all doomed. So the soldiers take out their sharp swords. When the ropes put the boat over the side, they there goes the boat with nobody in it. They slice the, the ropes and they go. <clears throat> and so what he says here in the use of this breaking of bread, <clears throat> um, in, uh, in 2735, he says, um, um, I, I've got to read a little bit ahead of time. Verse 32, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any one of you will perish. And this is a, an apostolic prophecy that he is giving to these people on the boat. Okay? He says, having said this, and this is our verse, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, and he broke it, and they began to eat. Let me tell you, this is not a, a communion service. This is... This is breaking a desperate time of no eating because of a crisis. There, he's saying, you need to get your strength. we got some stuff ahead of us. Time to eat, people. Relax. Enjoy a little bit of nutrition. <clears throat> so it's used in that fashion here. And then down in verse 30, um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let's see. Then there's, there's sometimes when um, we get back to our verse there in, in chapter 2, verse 42, and we go, well, okay, so sometimes it means communion, sometimes it doesn't. What is it here in Luke 2, 42? Well, if we read the passage in the context, <clears throat> let's go on. It says in verse 46, day by day, continuing with one accord, with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. It would appear in the immediate context that breaking of bread, although it's not certain, I'm saying it may, but it doesn't have to be that they were that it was communion, but it could have been that the, the, the big thing of they just wanted to be together and in and, and very clear Oriental, Eastern Oriental fashion, Hospitality, togetherness, communion was communion of fellowship. It wasn't necessarily that they were having daily, uh, you know, this is my body which is broken for you. This is a cup remembrance of me. It was the intense desire. Now they had a genuine love for togetherness. And we're going to see this in another point <clears throat> of their aspect of, of wanting to just be together. So our devotion to the Lord is, um, is seen in, in the breaking of bread. I'm going to say it's, it could be either because they both will do that. If, we, if when we have communion service, that is a time when we acknowledge we are organically, vitally, and eternally connected by the Spirit of God to the body of Christ. And it's not a light thing. It's not a human-made thing. It's a divine relationship 
you're part of. And you shouldn't treat that reminder and that symbol of that reality lightly. It could have consequences. But also, because we love one another, isn't it sweet to be able to sit down and to break bread together around the table? There's talking and there's things that you can, that extra time and you're just sharing. I, uh, I'm going to camp on that a little bit more. But I want to talk about the next one too. And I want to correct something that's better in the, a better translation. It's, I looked it up carefully to make sure that this was not a, a mistake. But the second expression of the evidence of devotion to corporate worship is in our verse 43, and it was continually devoting themselves to, and the, the, the Greek text has it this way, the prayers. The article is there, and it's plural, the prayers, referring to something specific. They were devoting themselves to the prayers. And... <clears throat> Whenever this church would meet, sometimes it was in large meetings. They, it says in verse 46, day by day continue with one accord in the temple, with one mind in the temple. There were times this was a place they could go. And it probably, it probably was these people who had thought of the temple and the services that were performed at the temple were these rituals, and now they see Christ in the whole thing. And so to them, they're going, and it means so much more when they go to the temple. And those sacrifices are a picture of Christ. And, and uh, the washings and these things, they see the picture for what it was supposed to be teaching them. Finally, they see Christ. And it was also a place with that great big courtyard they could go over and they'd say, you know, they could text one another and say, we're going to be meeting today over at the southeast corner of the temple grounds. And they all gather over there. And I'm sure that some of the priests and Levites, they're, they're going, man, here they are again. And they're over there and they're, they're joyous and they're singing and listen to them praying. They were like no other group of people in that whole temple situation. Can you picture it? But they weren't just meeting there. But whenever they got together, and the temple, and I think this is one of, the, um, one of the reasons why it's interpreted with the article and in the plural, refers to set, understood prayers. That's one of the characteristics of, of historic Judaism is that there are certain prayers from the Psalms or from Scripture that are offered. They're, they're done together. And, you know, there's a big difference in the way we should be praying and the way that sometimes other prayers take place in dead churches. I don't know if you've ever been in a liberal, modernistic church and the kind of praying that they do. One of the things that, and I'm not, I, I'm not trying to, it's just, it's just an experience that I've had but sometimes when, I, when the community will ask me to come and pray for an event, or they'll come to a funeral, or they'll, they'll be at something, or, or we'll be meeting in an office of a professional here, and I'll, as we're getting wrapped up, I'll just say to them, would you mind if we just ask for God's help? Would you mind if I just spend a moment and just pray? They're so caught off guard because we're really in, we're really enjoying the presence of the Lord, and, and we're sincerely saying, Lord, you know what we're dealing with here. And, and after we finish praying, it's such a unique impact. And I'm not saying I'm doing it for that. It's just the result of a little exposure to their seeing how we, how we intimately relate to the Lord. And, and, it's, and it, really is, it really is attractive to them, I think. The prayers. Prayer ought to not just be <clears throat> some formal at meals only, lest this mess we're about to, whatever. It should be you find out that something just happened and you're frustrated and you just 
mama or dad should say, kids, let's gather together, let's thank the Lord, or let's ask the Lord for help. Were you raised that way? Huh? Did you have that kind of Jesus contact in your home? What about now? Is there any reason why you can't just bring him into situations? The bills arrive and you go, whoa, the taxes. They don't stress. Your father in heaven knows what you needed before you. He knew that was coming. Just take it to him. You know, there's a lot of things we shouldn't be carrying. We can just drop them on his shoulders. He's capable. The prayers. Another way of expressing of the corporate devotion and, and showing how we love the Lord is, is um, in corporate worship is praise and joy. <clears throat> Praise and joy. Verse 46 and 47 says, Day by day, continuing with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God. Listen, people. I'm all for seriousness in worship. I'm all for Christians being appreciative of the, of the majesty and the holiness and the awesomeness of being in God's presence. But as Rashid's going to be teaching this lesson, Christ, if you would have been here for those three years, walking with the disciples, with Christ from place to place, Christ was characterized, in spite of times of sorrow and brokenness for the people that he saw their needs, sheep without a shepherd, the takeaway you would have gotten most of the time from Christ is joy, gladness. Can you give me one reason with what we know is in store for us and with what we know our resources are now and that who walks with us day in and day out, why we should be overcome by anxiety. Does your home have joy in it? I'm not talking about manufactured, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, these things. I'm talking about genuine thankfulness, satisfaction, Release joy. My mom and dad were great parents. And dad is a pastor and mom is a pastor's wife. They had plenty of other people's problems to carry. But I'm telling you what, one of my fondest memories is the times when we would just be cracking up. Laughing, laughing, laughing. Laughing at one another. My dad was not too proud to bungle it, and we would just start cracking up. And instead of him getting mad that we were laughing at him, he would just laugh along with us. Then we'd laugh at how he was laughing, and it was just sort of a back and forth thing. And what a wonderful childhood I had. But Jesus Christ laughed. Jesus Christ had an expression. He didn't have worry lines all the time. He was a man of praise and gladness. And so should we be. Early Christians, nobody had to teach them this. The burden had just been lifted and they were connected to the God of the universe. They knew Jesus Christ. They knew that even though he was ascended, he was demonstrating his leadership in their life and in their church. What a joy, what a joy. The present participle here <clears throat> is uh, praising God means it was an ongoing thing. It wasn't just rare. It, it marked their corporate times together and it oozed out into the daily living as they were spending so much time together. The, and the only way that this can happen without it being artificially manufactured is when you keep in mind you have the mind of Christ. 
It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, <clears throat> If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. In the Psalms, <clears throat> Psalm 57, 7 is a great example. The psalmist, even in times of real stress and trial and danger, he would purpose, he would have resolve to praise the Lord and to focus on him. Listen to what he said in Psalm 57, 7. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. And you know when he did it? He, you know when he wrote this particular song? He was in a cave hiding from the most powerful man in the country, King Saul. He wasn't just saying it, he was practicing it. That's how it worked. We resolve to be people who, because we know the Lord, the God of the universe, the, who's done so much for us. So the first mark of a healthy church is continual devotion to the Lord. And then we resolve to be devoted to our together times of being devoted to the Lord. <clears throat> All right, number two. A healthy church is marked by continued devotion to the Lord's people. Now you're going to get uncomfortable to the Lord's people. It says here in verse, uh, verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Again, the literal Greek translation of this term is the fellowship. The article is there, literally. Listen, folks. You cannot be devoted to Christ, the head of the church, and not love the body of Christ. You know what that's like? Fellers, when you were dating your wife, if you would have said to them well into that relationship, you know, I really like your face, but I don't know about your body. I suggest you wouldn't be sitting next to her right now. <coughs> that would be the last date. Now, I'm, I'm not saying the body of Christ should outshine the head, which is Christ. But because it's his body, shouldn't we love it? Is there a perfect church? You've heard the old saying, if you find the perfect church, stay away from it, you'll ruin it. There is no perfect church. This church wasn't a perfect church. We're going to see that in the, it, real soon in the book. It was not by any means the perfect church. But when the writer of Hebrews writes, he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, he exhorts us to not forsake our getting together. Most of the time, that's preached about being here for Sunday services. Listen, it doesn't say that. It includes that, of course. That's the first day of the week. It's the main time we meet on a weekly basis. So don't miss it if you can, if you at all can help it. Be here. If you got the virus, stay home. We'll let you, we'll excuse you. But if you can come, come. And when you come, be here with joy and praise and exalt the Lord and look out for the Lord's body and be part of it. But... <clears throat> I'll give you a clue of how to make your time with the Lord's people even more precious. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3 again. Because we mess up, God has provided for how we should be constantly putting band-aids on our relationships. Colossians 3 verse 13 I better start the sentences up in 12. So then as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, 
gentleness and patience. But it goes on. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. You know, you have no legitimate biblical reason to not do this. Because Christ has forgiven you so much more than you have to forgive whoever. That he says, if you, don't, if you can't do that, you don't know what his forgiveness is. They go hand in hand. If you've known the forgiveness of an infinite debt, you can forgive a small debt. And any debt we have in offenses with one another is nothing compared to our offense to God. I love these verses. Oh. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Why did he write that? Because we need each other's, we need that, that from each other. So, <clears throat> we're devoted to the Lord's people. Now, to have fellowship, and this word fellowship, by the way, <clears throat> is the word koinonia, and I, I like to try to condense it to this idea. It's partnership. There's been times when I've asked to counsel or give advice to small businesses that are either thinking of forming or they've been formed and they're having difficulty and they're asking for somebody, an outsider, to come in and take a look and give some suggestions. <clears throat> Whenever we're talking about a person forming a business and they're thinking about these two guys coming in and being partners, I say, let's talk about what a partnership is. Partnership is mutual identity. And as soon as you start, as soon as you stop thinking of that person that you're partnered with, of their perspective and trying to understand them, it begins to be unpartnered. It works with marriage. As soon as a couple begins to, to think of the offenses and how that person has wronged me, and it starts to be that kind of thing, it becomes an unpartnership. You might legally be bound, but it gets more miserable by the day. Fellowship, koinonia, <clears throat> these people, they shared everything in common. And I don't want to submit to you, that, well, we'll get down to it in a second, but the first thing, there, if you try to force this sort of koinonia partnership mentality with unsaved people, let me tell you, it does not work. It just won't work. So that's why our membership process here is to try our best to let us sit down and hear your testimony. Be here a little while. Let us, let us see you walk in with the Lord. Let us see your sensitivity to sin. Let us see the evidence of your life in Christ. Because a church that is made up of unsaved people and saved people is not going to work. So... Being devoted to the Lord's people, they, we've got to have, this fellowship's got to involve, we've got to have salvation. It says in verse, back there in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, <clears throat> notice at the end of that it says, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Not those who were just becoming part of the group, it was those who were being saved. It's a, that's essential. Then, <clears throat> this is duh, very big duh. <clears throat> but to have fellowship with, God, with the Lord's people, we have to be together. Notice with me, please. This is impressive. If, when I'm studying, I will cut and paste the passage of Scripture. And then I use colors and markers and things to bring out the observations. Look at the words together. Verse 44, all those who had believed were what? together and had all things in common. Look at verse <clears throat> uh, verse 46. Day by day contend with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals what? Together. together. They just couldn't get enough of each other. They just wanted to be together. It wasn't a chore. It wasn't an obligation. Two days before they were strangers. Now they're 
eternal, eternally related in the family of Christ. And they're together. They could not, they did not want to be apart. So, <clears throat> it's, um, some people say, well, you know, I don't like being in big churches. They get, get to be um, impersonal. Well, this church was big right from the get-go. Huge church. 3,120 people are approximately that way. And within, by the time we get to chapter 4, verse 4, it now adds to that number and comes up to bring around 5,000. Because every day, they're getting more and more people that are coming in and trusting Christ and growing. And then it kept growing from there. In chapter 5, verse 14, I won't turn there, but it's, it gives another indication. It kept growing. In chapter 6, verses 1, and verse 7 kept growing. This church in Jerusalem was known because it kept growing and growing and growing. Where did they meet? Wherever they could because there was no address. They met at the temple. I, have, I would imagine the temple was under significant stress. <laughs> you start getting that many people. They had never had groups like that ever in the history of Israel. That were, th this was a new thing. By the way, From time to time, I get somebody will call us and say, Pastor, are we going to be doing this walk in the community with all these other Christians and all these other churches? And you don't hear us talk about that. <clears throat> I, uh, I'm not, if you want to go do that, I'm not going to discipline you or speak against you. You can do that. But our, uh, I'm, not, I'm not into that personally and my leadership. Because it, to me, I wonder about the real purpose you got who knows what and what they've had to compromise in their beliefs to come together. It is, it is a bringing together of disunified beliefs is what I see it as. But there's two kinds of unity in the Bible. Just real quickly, let me just mention this. There's two levels, really, of Christian unity. One is called, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, is called the unity of the Spirit. Now, this is not something we develop. It's something the Spirit of God makes and maintains. We are told to understand it's there and to, it's said in that passage, to preserve it. We're to see it as precious and a real thing. We are to preserve it. And later on in that same chapter, there is another sort of unity that is called the unity of the faith. And this is something that we are to strive for. We are to attain to. It's a different thing. We come to a deeper knowledge of Christ and grow in spiritual maturity. And that is a unity of faith. So both of those, those are different. Both of them are necessary. But folks, what binds us together here is our common relationship to Christ and our common understanding of the truth of Christ. And we don't, we don't want to disregard that. The third aspect of devotion to the Lord's people is, is understanding that fellowship involves that we must share together in the things, in the things of God. Many times when Christians come together, there's a lot of conversations, different types of topics that we can bring up. We can talk about you know, your hobbies or your sports and, or the weather or whatever. There's a lot of topics, and, and they're fine. But I want to suggest to you that there is an opportunity to go deeper. And men and women, we need to have conversations. I, I would hope that because of our time in the Word and what we're, how we're growing in our private life, that when we get together with other people, there'd be questions about this passage of Scripture. We'd be wanting to talk about the marvels of this particular aspect of truth. And they just, it's just, I think that really pleases the Lord. And by the way, <clears throat> um, using your home, I encourage you to use your home don't wait. Don't say, well, it's not the way I want it to be. Stop it. Just let down. Bring people in. One of the things that I will tell you that I really appreciated about the pastor that started this church, Ron and Wanda, they lived in the house that Jim and Chris live in now, but their house, it was nowhere near 
what Jim and Chris have worked it up to be. There was a lot of it un unfinished, and Ron was not the most gifted carpenter. I hope you're not listening, Ron. <clears throat> but that home was always open. They had nacho night. They had spaghetti on a regular basis. And you talk to the people that were here in those early, early days, that home was a tool for the early church at Valley Bible. When I came here to visit the very first times, I knew Ron from before, but nothing changed. Wanda, was she, she would decorate that in the most cute little way. You remember when you went in? She's, she's kind of handy with crafts and stuff, but I mean, it was a warm, friendly, accepting place. When brand new people would come, I mean, these students from SUU that were just, you know, not, they, weren't in, they were in a strange community going to a new school, but they found a home. Your home could be like that. Share together. You must be together. <clears throat> then we must share together in the material things. And this is where this passage is often taken off. It's not communism. This isn't, you know, where you don't, where every, everybody, because communism doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. It cannot sustain. There's not a single historic example of communism flourishing. It becomes a using by the powerful to oppress the others, and there's no incentives. This is not what this was about. But it's using the home. You've got to think about what their situation was. There were thousands of these people that had come in from all over the, the empire. They were there for Feast of Pentecost. And after they had been saved... They wanted to stay longer and get grounded in their new faith, and they needed a place to stay. There was no holiday inn, and they needed help. And so people were just instantly identifying with these previous strangers that are now seen as fellow believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so homes were just being opened up, and, and when, when, they were, when the folks were running out of money and time, and there was more, here, I've got extra. I don't need this anymore. Let's get, and it was just an, uh, putting things in priority is what it was. And I think it, the, the situation changed. After a while, these people did go back. They took what they learned from Christ and went back to their homes. And that's how, you know, the gospel started spreading. But, and I'll tell you, this church does that. Right now, our brotherly love fund is a healthy fund. And people with needs, all we need to know is be able to determine what's the need. How can we help? Sometimes it may not be money. It may be some step in and just give a little hand to help fix something or just do something. But I've never seen the men fail when we need to move somebody, put their furniture out from the truck into the house or vice versa. This church responds. When somebody's got a car problem, this church responds. It's Christ, people. I'm not saying that to say you're just something special. It's what Christ has done. We're together, and we share in those ways. Well, <clears throat> there's the third and final, and this is not a huge point, the healthy church is, is also and finally marked by continual devotion to the Lord's work in the world, and the text doesn't really go into that. It, there were some hints of it, but if you follow what happened in the next chapters, th there was a reaching out. It was natural. Nobody was forced. It just was happening. Evangelism was taking place partly because of what the apostles were doing. I mean, these men were supernaturally gifted to do signs and wonders. In the next chapter, you're going to, in the next two chapters, you're going to see how they, they're out and about, and all of a sudden they find this guy, and they heal him, and everybody sees it, and boom, 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 everything starts happening. And this is, I mean, people, it was just, 
because of Christ and you, they were bubbling over with just wanting everybody to know about Christ, the risen, ascended, glorious Savior. Can't we be that way? <clears throat> so, this was their church. It was a reproducing church. A healthy church is devoted first to the Lord, to the Lord's people, and then to the Lord's work in the world. <clears throat> I think that you and I, in our, when we're healthy and when we're growing, we long for a church where the Bible is faithfully taught, and then where it's related to our daily homes, our experiences, our marriages. We look for a warm, loving, caring, supporting fellowship, don't you? We seek to have a sense of the living God and his greatness in worship. And we're looking for a compassionate outreach to people. Listen again, no church is perfect. Our church is definitely not perfect. I wish we had a bunch of visitors here today that could hear me say that. Our church isn't perfect. There's no church perfect this side of heaven. <clears throat> but listen. As we continually devote ourselves to the Lord through his word, through worship, as we continually devote ourselves to the fellowship of his people, and we devote ourselves to his work in the world, he will use us to glorify himself. I challenge you. What are you going to take home from this? I challenge you, first of all, be fervent in your love for the Lord Jesus. And then to his people and then to the people that need to know him. There's no telling what one person, how God could use one person who genuinely loves him and his people and the lost. Will you be that person? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the portrait, the exposure of what this early church was like. We thank you for the way it just, it was, it was nothing planned. There was no book that said this is the way it had to be. It was just the natural result of them being lifted from the guilt of their sin and coming to know the risen, ascended, glorious Lord Jesus Christ who had sent his spirit to live within them. And you're still doing that. We now have the powerful assurance of your word instead of these apostles that are among us to tell us what the word of God is. We, they've transmitted all of that into the written complete word. Thank you for the Bible. Help us to not neglect it. But Father, help us to realize what we started by talking about this morning is that it's not a list that we've got to check off. It all starts with do we know our Lord? Do we love him? And it goes from there. Help me, Father, to grow in my devotion to you through Christ. For it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's turn in our hymn books to number...